Hello everyone, my name is Aditya and as Robin mentioned, I'm the coordinator for animal ethics in India. And today I'll be mainly uh, looking at how sentient animals are affected uh, by the floods in India. And I'll also be trying to outline some measures uh, in, through which we can assist the animals that are affected by floods. Um, okay, so this was a paper that I have been working on. It's a literature review where I've talked to uh, many academics. Uh, I've basically tried to review and integrate insights from research papers, news articles, and videos about the impacts of floods on wild animals in different regions of India. Um, and I've also done interviews with scientists and staff from different wild animal organizations uh, related to the most significant effect of floods uh, on animals living in the wild. Um, it is important to note here that uh, Animal Ethics is an anti-speciesist organization. So by rejecting speciesism, we also take seriously the issue of wild animal suffering. So in this, in this uh, paper, I, have, I was mainly considering the interests or the well-being of wild animals from their welfare perspective, but not from their conservation or from the biodiversity lens. We are not looking at this issue from an ecocentrist viewpoint, but I was mainly trying to get an understanding of what their welfare is and how their uh, lives are affected uh, during the floods. Um, okay, so the my, I have this presentation in two parts. In the first part, I will mainly try to present the findings that I had on uh, some insights on how the lives of animals were affected, how, how was their welfare, uh, was it positive or negative, different harms they underwent. In the second part, I will try to outline some of the measures that we can undertake to help them. Um, so in this, uh, in this case study, I mainly look at two regions. Uh, one is Assam, which is in the northeastern part of India, and the other one is Kerala, which is in the south uh, western part of India. Um, these two regions uh, have the highest uh, uh, occurrences of floods. Um, so I chose, and they also have like a, a higher density of wild animals. So I decided to take both these regions uh, for my case study. Um, the first region is uh, in Kaziranga National Park in Assam, which is uh, situated in a district called as uh, Biswanath. It's, it's between the districts of Biswanath, Gulagat, Nagao, and Sonitpur. Um, and it usually has a, a subtropical monsoon climate with temperatures ranging between 5 to 25 degrees. The monsoons, the heavy monsoons, usually occur in the months of July and September. And around this time, close to 50 to 70 percent of the park is completely submerged by flood water. Uh, and the park is home to many species of large animals uh, as well as uh, aquatic animals. So the floods uh, significantly impact the lives of these animals. Uh, the, the next region that I decided to take into my case study was uh, in Kerala, in a place called as Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve, which is a southwest Indian state. Um, the region has a very high precipitation, but in the recent decade, Kerala has been facing with a lot of high intensity flash floods. And Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve is one of the regions with a, a lot of uh, wild animal uh, population. Um, so I, I decided, and there's also a lot of uh, data available about how these animals were affected. So that's one of the reasons why I also decided to take this region into my case study. All right, so now to present to you some of the major findings uh, uh, during my literature review. Um, in both these animals, uh, sorry, in both these regions, animals were found to naturally migrate to the natural highlands. In the Kaziranga National Park, animals usually migrated to the hills called as Kabi Anglong in the southern boundary of the national park. Uh, whereas for Kerala as well, animals usually uh, migrated to the natural highlands. Um, it is important to note their movements because this allows us to understand what the behavior of animals is like during uh, these disasters. Uh, it was also commonly observed that many animals would, were displaced, injured and affected with diseases associated with the floods. Um, many animals perished in the floods by drowning. Uh, in Kerala in the 2018 floods, which was one of the worst floods since 1924, uh, many animals uh, the carcasses of many animals were found, including tigers, elephants, peacocks, gore, bisons, 
cobras, and porcupines. Um, similarly, even in Kaziranga National Park on, in the same year, many animals which did not die by drowning died due to chronic stress and starvation post the floods in Kaziranga National Park. Um, also looking at aquatic animals, floods have, uh, during floods, there, there has been uh, observation that the oxygen levels in the water decreases a lot, which causes many temperate fish species uh, to die. And this, uh, this, this phenomenon where a, lot, a huge uh, number of fish die during floods is called as fish kills in the tropical floodplain water. Um, it was also noticed that the native fish are naturally adapted to characteristic uh, system extremes. They fare much better than the exotic species during floods. Um, and another important thing to notice here is that the among the animals that die, the highest mortality is among the juvenile life stages, which are particularly susceptible to uh, uh, harms during the extreme flood events. Uh, we also decided to take into consideration how invertebrates are affected. Uh, it's important to note here that in many of the papers, uh, the, the welfare angle was mainly used for the larger animals, for the vertebrates. There's very less information available for invertebrates. However, we looked at uh, population dynamics uh, and systems effects on invertebrates as well. And we tried to gather some information on how insects or invertebrates might be affected. So various studies uh, showed that the population decreases after floods, but they also quickly rebound. So if their population levels are considered as a proxy for the harm that the individuals or species of a particular invertebrate species undergo, then it is likely that these animals go through a lot of suffering due to floods because of uh, the higher amount of mortality seen immediately after floods. Um, also, the native fish that are naturally adapted to characteristic system extremes, they fare better than the exotic uh, species. Um, another thing we saw was uh, that uh, the aquatic animals were severely affected due to deposition of silt, which is basically from the riverbanks, the silt is carried into the mainlands of the national park, which causes low oxygen availability. And also from the surrounding regions, the farms, the organic pesticides, uh, like DDT and heavy metals, they flow into the water. So all of this uh, causes a lot of harm for the aquatic animals. Um, and especially due to these uh, pesticides, the pH level of water, uh, it decreases to 4.3 and 5.2, which, which causes a lot of uh, suffering to the endemic fishes and other aquatic organisms. Um, yes, um, and among invertebrates, uh, particular species like dragonflies, mayflies, and stoneflies, their population increases a lot after the floods. Um, but these invertebrates have a higher juvenile mortality and also higher uh, fecundity, which is basically they give birth to huge number of offsprings, but most of them die immediately after coming uh, into existence. So while their population increases, uh, there is more research to be done on how, what is their overall welfare like because usually most animals within these species that come into existence have a life that is usually dominated by negative experiences. Um, there are also indirect effect of floods causing topographical changes through erosion of topsoil or deposition of excess sil uh, silt, which affects the habitat suitability for herbivores. Uh, this uh, causes a food shortage for many herbivores. So the herbivores come out of the national park in search of food, which causes human animal conflict as well. Right. So these were some of the major findings uh, uh, from uh, the literature review. Uh, now I'll go into some of the ways in which uh, we can help these uh, wild animals during floods. So one intervention that was uh, undertaken by the government of India and uh, the forest authorities in Assam was constructing artificial highlands. Uh, as seen in this picture, these are uh, artificially raised highlands that are five meters uh, in length and 140 meters in breadth. Uh, they were, there are around 144 of these highlands, artificial highlands built uh, in the Kaziranga National Park. And it was seen that uh, a lot of animals benefited from uh, 
the, the highlands, many rhinos, bisons, and gars were seen to have been uh, escaping the floodwaters and taking shelter on these artificial highlands. And the government has also provided veterinary support on these artificial highlands and planted uh, food growing crops like gooseberries um, and other, other fruit uh, growing uh, crops, which uh, provide uh, food for the larger herbivores. While larger herbivores did benefit, it is also reasonable to assume that many uh, slow uh, moving uh, small animals also benefited from the artificial highlands. But certain other animals like uh, elephants, they prefer to move to the natural highlands. Um, but yeah, overall, artificial highlands did prove to be quite effective in helping animals uh, uh, escape from the floodwaters. So this is an intervention that can probably be uh, also experimented with in other regions. Uh, another intervention intervention that uh, I outline is including wild animal protection into national and state policies into the disaster resilience framework. So while uh, uh, rescuing farm animals is included within the national and state disaster rescue plans, uh, wild animals are not given a lot of consideration except for like the more endangered species. Um, so there are certain clauses that talk about also protecting wild animals but uh, including it more explicitly and building upon this framework could potentially be very useful. Um, there are also many wild animal organizations in India, like uh, Wildlife Trust of India, Wild Animal Protection, Wildlife Conservation Trust, um, combined with uh, funding agencies like uh, International Fund for Animal Welfare. Uh, all of them have teamed up to set up uh, these uh, uh, units called as VERU, which is Veterinary Emergency Response Units, uh, to provide more uh, veterinary capacity uh, during uh, disasters. Uh, similarly, even Wildlife Conservation Trust has set up emergency relief network, where during a disaster, it gathers a lot of, uh, it gathers the surrounding rescuers, uh, rehabilitation centers, and everyone together to provide immediate relief to the animals suffering during floods. Um, another major constraint that most uh, wild animal rescue organizations are facing now is with respect to transportation for injured animals. Uh, there is a shortage of uh, shelters for rescued animals during floods. Um, and most uh, people in Kaziranga National, most rescuers in Kaziranga National Park still use manual boats, which is highly inefficient and is also not conducive to helping uh, animals when they are injured. So uh, having more mechanized uh, vehicles, including speedboats and also rescue aircrafts could potentially be very, very useful in, uh, uh, in offering timely treatment to animals and providing in situ uh, treatment to animals. Um, the next one is vaccinating farmed animals in the area surrounding the national parks. It has been observed that uh, soon after the floods, there is, uh, there's an outbreak of diseases uh, there's many diseases like uh, rabies, uh, tuberculosis, uh, goat pox, uh, and many other infections that spread from the farmed animals to the wild animals, uh, and also the foot and mouth disease. So they spread from the farmed animals to the wild animals. So it is po potential a, po a potential source of intervention is vaccinating the farmed animals uh, surrounding the national park, which would uh, prevent the, the spread of infection to the wild animals that are trying to escape the floodwaters. Um, another source of risk for most wild animals trying to escape the floodwaters is other poachers. Um, the Northeastern India has a lot of uh, poaching activities and it is, uh, but the government has invested a lot into anti-poaching measures. Uh, however, the camps, the anti-poaching camps are usually flooded with water and the teams that are there to stop poaching are not able to function effectively. So enhancing the anti-poaching measures, setting up better facilities to uh, monitor uh, the movement of poachers could potentially be very useful uh, in ensuring that the animals escape from the floodwaters to more safe zones. Um, and the seventh point is investing in landscape management and flood control structures. Uh, this has been uh, exp experimented on in other countries, but in India, it's still not uh, invested in a lot. There's not a lot of exploration that goes on into flood control structures. Um, 
However, while there has been some research going on with respect to uh, landscape management in close to the Brahmaputra River. So uh, a few other points were ensuring the safe disposal of the carcasses of wild animals, which is very important. Uh, so usually during the floods, uh, uh, burial, which is the usual form of disposal of the wild animal carcasses is not a feasible method because the soil is not, uh, I mean, the land is not uh, suitable for burying animals. Um, so having incineration facilities at different boundaries of the park, like mobile incineration vehicles would be very useful. So this was an insight given to me by one of the scientists working on uh, the issue of floods um, in Kaziranga National Park. And finally, uh, working on improving the rescue rehabilitation release process of orphaned animals. There have been many cases of orphaned rhinos and elephants. Um, where their uh, their parents die and the, the orphans get stuck in the flood water or in uh, in the uh, boggy land so they usually require assistance so improving the rescue rehabilitation release process of orphaned animals could also be another area of intervention the broad area of intervention that can be improved upon uh, in the case of floods so these are uh, this is a very uh, short uh, brief of uh, my paper. Uh, we will be publishing our paper on the Animal Ethics website soon. Uh, so I, if you're interested in learning more about the details of all the points that I have mentioned, I would highly recommend you check that out. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's about my talk. Thank you so much. Okay, hi everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Animal Joanne MacArthur and I'm an animal photojournalist. I'm the founder of We Animals Media and I've been doing animal photojournalism for about 20 years. I've been to over 60 countries to do so. And I'm really happy that this symposium is happening because we need to normalize looking at, talking about, seeing, thinking about and helping animals in disasters. Uh, this is still something that's quite fringe. And so I'm thankful to be taking part and thankful that you're doing this because it's giving us a path forward. Um, I am a, a storyteller predominantly. And so what I'm going to do today is share with you images and stories as someone who bears witness to animals in disasters. And I have a few points here over the next 15 minutes that I want to highlight through these stories. Uh, some of my observations are about censorship, media opportunities, the solitary nature of this work, both for the rescuers and for animal photojournalists, uh, systems of protection and escape, access and acceptability of this work. I'm going to start with the Australian bushfires and, uh, but first a warning of graphic content. Uh, I will be showing images of violence and death this is unfortunately the nature of my work, and this is what the bulk of my work is, just as with other conflict photographers and war photographers. Uh, so um, you have been duly warned, and thank you for bearing witness with me. Uh, so I'll start with the Australian bushfires, and something that's very apparent in documenting animals in wars and disaster is the solitary nature of this work. Um, there are very few rescuers because they're given very little access. And as we know, it's also not a priority uh, in this anthropocentric world that we live in. When there's a disaster of any kind, it's people first and animals tend to have to fend for themselves. So here we are at a makeshift, makeshift vet clinic in Australia. Someone has brought in a wounded and burned wombat. And I just love the, the empathetic, compassionate uh, nature of this, of this image. And uh, this is what I have to do when I'm photographing animals in disaster, disasters, is find those few people who are working on behalf of the animals. In the case of the Australian bushfires, there was an estimated 3 billion animals who were killed and many more who were injured. And there are no systems of protection for animals in disasters. We have very few people helping the very lucky few who get uh, aid. This is at the Southern Cross vet clinic, uh, a veterinarian wor working to help a, poss a possum. Uh, this is at the same clinic, a beautiful patching image of a wombat 
who is being given care after he escaped from the fires. And, uh, and it's solitary, again, a great example of, um, you know, th there's not a mass movement to help animals in disasters and wars. Uh, there are solitary people putting in long hours looking for, for example, in this picture, dehydrated koalas in trees that can be brought down uh, for care. And there are very few people offering care, uh, which is not set up. It's also interesting about what's acceptable, acceptable to document, who is acceptable to document, and who isn't. Uh, I had much more access in Australia during the fires when I was trying to photograph koalas and kangaroos, because generally people care about wild animals and want to see them helped. But then you get to the domesticated animals, the farmed animals, and it became a big issue for me as a photographer about access. Um, you get seen immediately. Who are you? What are you doing? Get out of here. And so often uh, as an animal photojournalist, you're photographing from the side of the road and then you're driving off and you'll see this recurring in my images. Um, the burnt landscapes, uh, that's what you're seeing here in these two images. These are not the kind of images that get published. Um, and yet this is the kind of carnage that we saw all around us during the fires. A shout out to my colleague at We Animals Media, Milos Pekanski, who has done really exceptional work at fires. Uh, this is in Greece. Uh, this is a goat who uh, must have burned alive. And an interesting aspect of his storytelling is that when you bring in the human factor into the stories of animals and wars and disaster, this is more acceptable as well uh, to be published and in the media because it becomes about our suffering, uh, our heroism when we have tried to help animals and so on. So this image, for example, is a much more acceptable image in the media than this is. Now, this is an interesting story as well of a horrific scene of sheep and cattle, cows and bovines in general who were uh, burned alive in the bushfires. This is shot by my colleague, Andrew Quilty. And this story was not about the animals, which is why it received a lot of media attention. This was a story about the farmers, the sadness of the farmers, interviews with the farmers about how they, they experienced the fires. And so when we are looking at this image, the point of the image when it was published is about um, the devastation that the, the farmers experienced and a GoFundMe was set up for the farmers so that they could help rebuild their homes and uh, start farming anew. Something else that I experienced in Australia, also documenting animals in disaster, is extreme censorship and media opportunities that are presented by the government and by NGOs so that they can strictly control the kind of images that the world is seeing. The reason this happens is because if you're photographing everything, what we're going to show is what's not happening and the void of help, the lack of disorganization. And so when I was able to get out into the field, it was really strictly controlled. It was with NGOs. It was with permission. I had to uh, do fire hazard training uh, with the government and so on. Now they told me to be at this place because the koalas were arriving and it was like, you know, a hundred cameras. Okay, look at the good work that the government is doing. I know I sound really sarcastic and frustrated and it's because I am as a photojournalist, you are given 15 minutes and you're not treated very well to, you know, to get these photo ops. So here you have um, koalas who've been rescued from the fires arriving at a, an organized vet clinic with the RSPCA. I was allowed to photograph her and then they kind of shoo you off. A few days later, there was another huge photo op of animals in disaster. And it was of 10 koalas who were being removed uh, after being triaged to zoos in Melbourne. And so they invited the media. They kind of make you stand at a, a certain place off to the side. They show you one koala who has been rescued. The Australian Air Force came in to <laughs> to bring these 10 koalas to a zoo. They could have brought, you know, um, a van and thought nothing of it. There are roads out of these places, but they wanted to make a big media photo op. And that is what you see over and over again in places of disaster. The stories want to be controlled. Interestingly, 
Uh, some of the people who rescued these koalas you saw in those pictures, those 10 koalas, are people who are also being censored, small NGOs like this one. Uh, this is a group called Vets for Compassion. And they were going off 24 hours a day trying to get koalas down from, uh, from the eucalyptus plantations. And um, the, the government was mostly imposing restrictions on them. You can't go here, you can't do that. No, you can't have help. And so you have a small number of people doing an incredible amount of work when in fact, an incredible amount more work should be done, uh, but it's made impossible. During that time, I photographed this image of a kangaroo and her joey who survived the fires. And it's really important for photojournalists to incorporate the animal stories so that we can get them out there, of course, and normalize the conversations that animals too are affected by disasters, of course they are. And um, it's important for animal photojournalists to also submit their images to media constantly, even though it's an uphill battle, and to awards, because that's how you get much more visibility, yes, but normalization of, um, of these stories. I have to hurry up, I still have a lot of uh, slides to go through. Uh, a few more images of the BP oil spill. Now this very much is about censorship. I went down to the Gulf of Mexico to photograph the effects of the oil spill on the, on the animals, but anyone in the media, especially covering the animals, was heavily followed, censored, controlled. Here I am with Greenpeace. This is one of the only ways you can get out uh, to get photographs as an animal photojournalist is to pair with an NGO and they're mapping out where they want to go. We get in the boats and not half an hour later, here comes the Coast Guard telling us to turn back because we don't have the right permit. Are we photographing? But uh, this is the kind of control that you are subjected to when you are a photojournalist, especially covering animal stories. And once again, the media opportunity. So I was among at least 50 photographers here where they were. Uh, I was talking about censorship, accessibility, and now I want to just show a few famous images that we have seen about uh, humans in war, humans in famine, uh, genocides, refugees, images that have become part of the zeitgeist, images that have helped create change and, um, and create conversation. Well, that's what we're trying to do it, we animals media, and that's what animal photojournalists are trying to do is, is trying to uh, get these difficult images that are so hard to publish into, into the world. Uh, we created, actually, first I will show you this massive book, you can see me, this is Inferno by James Noctway. And um, he is a famous war photographer. It's this huge book, look at the size of this. <laughs> and um, I saw that many years ago and I thought, I want to do something similar for animals. We talk a lot about uh, humans in, in disasters, but what about all of the billions of animals, the gazillions of animals worldwide who are affected? And so we have, <laughs> my, my torn version, we made a similar book. Uh, it's called Animals in the Anthropocene, and it's an unflinching look at our uses, abuses, and sharing of spaces with animals. Uh, here are a few of those images. Uh, the intro chapter uh, forward is by Joaquin Phoenix, and it's called The War on Animals. And in animal photojournalism, I use the word war not to self-aggrandize uh, in any way, but to make people think war. What, is, what does she mean war? What does an animal photojournalist mean war? Like photojournalists cover war, they're conflict photographers, they cover street photography and to bring animals, non-human animals into the question, it's very, it's odd and surprising for people. I want them to think about, well, what do photojournalists mean when they talk about a war on animals? It's a curious word, but of course there, there is, there's a massive war and a massive conflict. Um, the book includes this 320 pages, uh, lots of facts, lots of storytelling from over 40 photographers globally. We're very, very proud of what we're putting out into the world. We are showing the connections between wet markets, as you see here, and COVID. We're seeing the incredible, incredible abuse that animals withstand. We are showing 
uh, the effects on animals of, of when there are pandemics that are caused by our use of animals. I will point out, you see here that this photograph is credited to someone who has to remain anonymous. This is the case with animal photojournalists quite often. We have to protect ourselves because we go to great lengths as conflict photographers do to gain access. Uh, sometimes we do so illegally. Sometimes we have to trespass and in certain countries we could actually be putting ourselves in great danger if we were to put our name next to the images that we publish. Uh, this is by Jeff Mitchell. This is another one of the examples of the photos in the book of, uh, of animals in disasters. Often the stories when it comes to disasters are about the humans, but this book brings it back, brings it back to what the animals go through. The dedication to our book, uh, in the book, Hidden Animals in the Anthropocene, is inspired in part by the war memorial dedicated to animals in London. Uh, it reads, the inscription reads, they had no choice, but what we did is dedicated it to the animals uh, and wrote, they have no choice, uh, because this is all too often and across the board, the, um, the situation, they have no choice. Now onto Hurricane Florence, another example of, um, of um, uh, access uh, and censorship and how people are not incentivized to help animals in, uh, in disasters. So here we have a few of the lucky survivors of the floods. These are animals who um, are able to stand on the porch. People were bringing them uh, food every day. Here are two survivors. Uh, a sanctuary came and tried to rescue these animals, but in fact, the farmers and the police came and the animals were corralled back eventually onto a transport truck and brought back to the farm and eventually to slaughter. Um, but generally animals in floods have to fend for themselves um, and often they simply can't. Something else about the solitary nature of this work again, it's apparent in all of the disaster work that I do, there are very few people going out to help the animals. And what is acceptable is to go out and help the companion animals and the wildlife, but not the farmed animals. And so here I was able to piggyback with an organization who were spending long days and nights but, um, trying to find uh, pets. We were heavily policed. There were police boats always coming up to us, ask us what we were doing, why we had a camera. Oops, sorry. And, um, and we were often turned away. And sometimes we were, uh, some of my colleagues in fact were threatened that they would be shot if they got any closer to the farms that we were approaching. Uh, in the background, you see a farm that uh, housed chickens. There is no incentive to create ways to protect animals in disasters. So what happens is the farmers are insured, their property is insured, uh, animals are considered inventory. And uh, so what, and also we just don't have the infrastructure to help animals in disasters. We don't have enough trucks. We don't have enough place to put them. And it just shows the commodification of, of animals. And, um, and so here, what you see is a flooded barn. Uh, likely what happened is the farmers fled and locked the doors and you know, good luck to the animals inside. And as it turns out, an estimated 5.5 million animals drowned in these floods. A few examples of the images I obtained, which were, were published globally, which was good. Uh, really hard to get these kinds of images. Again, you're highly pleased, highly censored, um, but we need more and more people out there doing this so that we can get these stories out there. Uh, the fish are affected too. This was a, uh, what they refer to as a fish kill. When the oxygenation of the water changes during floods, uh, when uh, the feces from factory farms run off into the environment, uh, lots and lots of animals die as a result. So this is an example of that as well. I also want to point out, you know, what we call a disaster. Uh, I've given here examples of, of floods and fires. I think we could all agree, though, 
that the disaster is our treatment of animals as a whole in and of itself. This is during a heat wave at the Turkish-Bulgarian border. I went to document the, um, the conditions the animals were, were traveling in across the border down into Turkey. The animals were transported illegally. You're not supposed to um, transport them over a certain temperature, but millions of animals are transported regardless. Uh, they suffer immeasurably. Here they are briefly being let off the, the truck to get some water. And it was heartbreaking to see the animals uh, left in a truck. And one of them here on the right is, is reaching for a little bit of, of greenery. But yeah, I would say that the disaster is, is everything. <laughs> like it's, it's every use and abuse. It's the factory farming, it's the fur farming, it's the animals in the labs. And so I wish that uh, the media and the public conscience could expand their um, their definition of, of disaster and include, to include all of these things. Uh, lastly, uh, this was just recently at one of the, the H5N1 outbreak here in Canada. Of course, this was global, but I want to illustrate uh, what's happening here. The factory farm in the background is where uh, thousands of animals are being killed because of the outbreak. And I'm hiding in a bush. This is like typical animal photojournalism stuff. I'm hiding in a bush. And you see the people in the hazmat suits in the background, you see a little bit of the factory farm. And I photographed this bird in the bush who was right there with me because this uh, poor red-winged red blackbird does not know that they too can be affected by this H5N1, which is caused by animal use, which spreads to wildlife and, and so on. It was very, very hard to get photos. Um, these places are cordoned off. Anyone with a camera is shooed away. And so often I get images like this by photographing from the road. Um, hard to do, you have to leave quickly. And yet the media do want these, these kinds of things. This was published in The Guardian. Uh, now to, excuse me, to wrap up, I think uh, what we're doing as animal photojournalists is helping to normalize these stories in the public conscience. And in the media, what we want is for animals and disasters to, to all be widely considered, and again, not just the wildlife, but the domesticated, the farmed animals as well. Um, my organization and I have a huge repository of images that all of you can use. I know many of you are using animal advocacy photography in your work. And uh, so we have almost 20,000 images here that you can use at weanimalsmedia.org. So please use that resource. The images are free. And uh, I think we have images from almost 80 countries now from over 75 photographers. So uh, please do use that. And I also wanna bring attention to uh, some of you who are interested in doing animal photojournalism or uh, improving your use of uh, cameras and video cameras during your investigative work in your journalism uh, you are welcome to check out our masterclass. We have a how-to on, on covering disasters and factory farms and how to cope with these things and so on. And that's also at weanimalsmedia.org. And uh, I'm looking forward to answering your questions.